Hi everyone. So we've created the events app in React, applying MongoDB, Express, and Node.js. Now let's convert it into Next.js and see how Next.js works. This is a great way to learn how React translates into Next.js. Why Next.js? From my own point of view, my two favorite reasons are one, it's server-side rendering, which means the loading time is so much faster for the user. It's faster because once the HTML has been delivered to the user's browser, aka client side, nothing else needs to happen. It doesn't need to wait for the client side JavaScript to run. Next.js specifically also enables automatic code splitting, which means it only loads the JavaScript and CSS that are needed for any given page, which also helps to speed up the load time as the browser doesn't need to download the JavaScript and CSS that it doesn't need. So it only uses what it needs. And more importantly, Next.js also makes it super easy to write backend code. We don't need to set up two different folders and we don't need Express. This makes the development faster as well. And the second reason is because deployment to Vercel is so easy. You'll see this at the end, but it's really as quick as one, two, three, minus the occasional build time errors. So how do we convert a React project into a Next.js project. Technically, there are two ways of converting a project. The first method is to do it within your React project, essentially installing Next.js and then update each file within your React project. The other way is not so much as converting a project per se, it's more like creating a fresh new project using what you've already done and then move things across and update it that way. I'll use the second method because I think it's more useful to see how things are done from the beginning. And then you can see how some of the elements are translated from the React way into the Next.js way. Let's get started. npx create next app at latest. You can put a full stop here if you want to create the project within the folder or to create a new folder containing the next project, you can give it a name here. If you press enter, it takes you through a list of options. TypeScript is great, but we won't use it here yet to avoid this being too much of a leap. So let's take it one step at a time and select JavaScript because it's much less of a learning curve. ESLint is a linter that helps you spot problems with your JavaScript code. I like having a linter, but not everyone does. So I always choose yes, but you can assess for yourself. Tailwind CSS, yes. Again, depends on what you're comfortable with. You can always choose no if you prefer pure CSS or bootstrap or the more recently very popular Chakra. A source directory, let's go with yes. Experimental app directory, no for now. Import alias, the at sign is fine. Once it's all done, it'll give us all the foundational files that we'll need, very similar to the React project, the npx create React app. You can see here, we've got our familiar public folder. In our source folder, we have pages. You'll see how this is used later on. Then we've got a global CSS file, which we should also be familiar with. It's just a different name here versus React. You can see we've got our linter JSON file and other settings and config files. If we run this by doing npm run dev as opposed to npm start, you can see the Next.js template page. Just as with our React project, we delete everything we don't need. You can see here, Next.js already has Google Fonts incorporated, and this is how you use it in the project. For someone who really enjoys front-end development, I think this is a really neat touch. It just makes getting a project started so much easier. In our source folder, let's create a components folder. The easiest component to start with is the navbar, I think. So let's dive right in, and uh, we can arrange the folder structure afterwards. All I've done here is to copy our existing navbar file across. 
let's import all the packages that we'll need. So that's recoil, react icons and axios for the moment. We'll need our recoil atoms. So I'm just going to drag the whole atoms folder across into our source folder. If you want to understand recoil a bit better in relation to this project, I'll link the video for this somewhere. We don't need the view option here, so let's just delete it. We're not going to use navigate here. Navigate is a React concept. For Next.js, we can use Next.js's router. We'll circle back to this in a bit. Let's make sure we have everything else we need in our navbar. For example, our auth modal. In our components folder, let's move our navbar into its own folder. Then create a new folder called modals. In modals folder, we just need to copy across our auth modal file. And in this file, we can comment out all the references to React's use navigate. And let's comment out the Axios post methods as well, because this will change as well. We can now add our navbar into our homepage and deal with anything we may have missed. We need to add recoil root to our app.js file like this. Make sure we have the parenthesis wrapped around the tags. We can swap the react link for our next link by importing link from next link. Next link uses href instead of two. So we need to update that. Now, instead of the react to use navigate, we can use next use router. That's const router equals use router first. You can see it automatically being imported from next router for us. To do the same thing as navigate, we can just do router.push followed by the path. Same, same, but different, you know? We can delete the references to React here and then update the references to use navigate in our auth modal file in exactly the same way. Now, if we click on the add button here, our modal is working in exactly the same way as our React project. And this is because Next.js is a framework on top of React. So that's why with JavaScript, it's not that much of a leap. One of the biggest differences is perhaps connecting to MongoDB. Now that we don't have our backend folder and all of our backend roots and files, where do we add our connection to MongoDB in Next.js? Let's have a look, shall we? First of all, in our .env file, we can just copy across our db uri string because that doesn't change. .env.local is the standard naming convention in Next.js. And let's install mongoose. Create an utils folder and create a file called connectdb.js. We import mongoose. We can connect to MongoDB via mongoose like this. 
const connectdb equals async callback function, then mongoose.connect. And we just need to pass in our db uri string. Export defaulter, and that's it. Then in our data models and schemas, I've copied over both the events and user schema files. Now, there is a Next.js quirk here. We need to export the model like this. Make sure we import schema models and model from Mongoose. We do the same for the users here. That's the MongoDB settings done. It's quite easy, isn't it? Just a little quirk, but not difficult. Let's have a look at the backend login process. From the MongoDB setup, we can see that the lines are fairly blurred between our frontend and backend in a way. With our backend roots, this needs to be in one specific place, and that's within our API folder. Think about the API folder as our backend folder. So let's set up a user folder and have a login.js file here. We import connectdb and user model first. Export default our login async function, which deals with the request and response. And then a try catch block. We'll try to connect to our database console logging the connection. Then we can copy and paste across the logging in logic. Now, on the front end, Let's see how we pass the data over to our login API. This line here is more or less the same. Instead of this React app login.env string, we can just type out the root to our API. The string must start with a forward slash, and then the root to our file is API slash user slash login. And then we pass through the user object as per usual. We can now uncomment this bit. Instead of router.push, let's console log res.data to see if it's working. And we can see it's showing up. Now we can do some light refactoring. If you watch the MongoDB video, I think I mentioned this whole res.data.data business. So instead of calling this the name data in our backend, Let's change it to user instead. Great. Everything is still working. Fantastic.
comparatively up to this point, it's much easier with Next.js, isn't it? Let's have a look at signing up. We import ConnectDB and user model. One difference to the pure React backend here is that we are connecting to the database per usage. In our signup, we can start with a handler async function that we export. In our handler function, we can direct the machine as to where to go depending on the request method through the use of a switch statement. So it's like a signpost. If the request method is get, we return get user. If the request method is post, we return add user. If it's to get the user, we can just copy across the relevant try catch block from React, likewise with add user. And now in our pages folder, the most important thing to know is that whatever we put in our pages folder will be our URL path. So think about the file names beforehand. For example, by having signup.js here, when we go to localhost 3000 slash signup, the browser will display whatever is in our signup.js file here. I've copied across the signup page and we can make the same kinds of updates.
I've made some other little updates to the web app along the way, such as this official website input field. and this sandwich menu. Sandwich menus are really easy in React actually. You just change the content depending on the state. So we have a menu open and a set menu open, setting the initial state to false. And then alongside our user icon, we can add two menu icons. If the menu is open, we'll show the cross icon. If the menu is not open, we show the menu icon, these three lines. And then we can start adding the content. So if a user opens the menu, what do we want to show them? We can do it in an unordered list. Because we'll be positioning the menu in a specific position, its parent tag needs to be set as relative. and then our menu can be absolute 10 pixels from the top, let's say zero from the right, and we can have a column with a gap of two. Let's show logout for now. We can add the functions in to open and close the menu. This is what we see now, the logout button here. We can decorate it so it shows up in the format that we like. And on click of logout, we can handle logout by simply setting the user to an empty string. Just like that. And send the user back to the home page and close the menu. Now we can do the sign up form. So for the sign up page, we can split out the components into the components folder and just drop in the sign up form like this.
At the moment, we're having to put the navbar into every file, right? We can do this in a much more efficient way. We can have a folder and inside it, a layout file that will dictate the structure of our page. So we'll have our navbar at the top of every page then children in our main tag. We'll add our footer to this later, but for now, let's just add it into our app.js file to see if it's working. We can put our layout just under our recoil root, wrapping around our component. If it doesn't automatically import the file for you, remember to import it manually. And in our layout, let's pass in the children here. Great, it's working because we can see two navbars now. This means we can remove the navbars separately inserted into our pages. So that's in the sign up page and the home page. Okay. Now our add an event page. We have our add event form file, so we just copy that across into our add event form.jsx. Then in our add event page, within our pages folder here, we just insert the form like this. We add the update and set update state here. Then drop it into our add event form. In our add event form, we import use router from next and define it down here. Now we can change navigate to router.push. Then we can set up our backend. So we get inside the API folder. We create an events folder and let's create an events.js file. Import connectdb from our utils folder import our mongoose events model from our events schema. We set up our handler because we'll have at least two general functions we'll carry out, getting the events and adding events, very similar to our user route. In our switch statement, we can take the request method, which is what will be passed through from our front end. That will either be a get method or a post method. In the case of a get method, we tell the machine to follow the steps in our get events function that we will soon add with the reg for request and res for response. If it's a post method, we direct the machine to our add events function. In our get events function, it will be async. So async function, get events, rec, res. Then we do a try catch block, try to connect to our DB console logging the steps so that we know where the machine's at. Then we can do const events equals await events model dot find with empty curly braces. The empty curly braces gets all of the events in our database, which is what we want. Then our response can send the events back to our front end. In the event of any errors we catch, let's console log it. Similar with the add event. In the try block, we connect to the database and then we run our new event through our mongoose model. So it looks like this, const new event equals new events model rec.body, the body of the request, which is what we're passing through from our front end. We save this event by doing const event equals new event dot save. And we can do res.status201.json event. 
This is to show that res.send and res.json do exactly the same thing when an object or array is passed. So you can choose between .send and .json. What res.json does is that eventually it calls on res.send, but before that it offers a little bit more. One of the additional things that we get with res.json is that when we're passing non-objects, such as null or undefined, res.json will convert these. Another set of additional things that res.json offers is settings, which you can optionally use. I won't get into it here, but I'll link some articles below if you're interested. So these are things like spaces or a replacer. Um, spaces is the number of spaces for indentation and a replacer is property transformation rules. Optional, you only use it when you need it. So I won't go into it here, but I'll link some articles below if you're interested. Now, when we go back to our add event form component, we can change the roots in our axios.get and axios.post to our new root, which is forward slash API slash events slash events. <laughs> I've done pretty much the same thing. Probably should have done a better job with the naming, but the computer is clever enough to recognize the difference between the events folder and the ev events file. Um, if we try it now, we of course get an error. Let's have a look. Let's get debugging. It looks like it's the error checking. So if we ignore this error checking section, everything works. Now let's take a closer look at where we're going wrong. Oh, we're missing the dot length for some of these. Let's add that in and try again. Great. Now the display. I've just dragged over the two files from our React project. So that's the events card and the events schedule. We add a hero folder and drag the hero file over from the React project. We add, we can add the hero and event schedule into our index.js file within the pages folder, i.e. our homepage, and drop in everything we'll need in each of these respective components. We need to get our events, so let's set up our state const events set events equals u state and this will be an array and then we have selected city and selected month the default for selected city is london and the default for selected month is month in string format and replace this process.env root with our next.js root and then we use effect for our get events uncomment line 87 in our add event form
delete the reference to link as it uses React rooted on and change it to link from next link instead. Import use state and use effect into our index.js, our homepage. And fab, done. I'm just going to tweak a couple of things in the events schedule page. It should be quite self-explanatory. In our index.js, we'll have to remember to import Axios and update root. I'm going to comment this out for now. I don't want anything to be deleted yet whilst we're working on our backend deletion function. In our handler, we can add an option for deleting an event. To delete the event, we grab the ID passed to our backend from our frontend and use the mongoose find one and remove like this. Update the axios.delete root. To address this API resolved without sending a response warning, we can add a response message like this.
Hmm. I think this is to do with the Axios delete method. A quick way around this is to stick with what we know and move this into our own backend file. And instead of axios.delete, we can do axios.post instead. And now it's working. I'll post some links below on the axios.delete method. So if you want to stick with axios.delete, you can use that instead. Now that we've got all of these pages working and we get the sense of how React translates into Next.js and how similar it is, let's work on something new. Hashing and sorting passwords. For that, let's install bcrypt first. So that's npm i bcrypt or npm install bcrypt. If you don't know what hashing and sorting is, hashing takes data of arbitrary size and converts it into fixed size value. So it takes the plain text password that the user types in and converts it into ciphertext. This already sounds a bit more secure for the user, right? And then we can improve it further by adding salt to the hashed password. Sorting refers to random characters being added to the hashed passwords. So this makes it even harder for hackers to get to the user's password. It's not impossible, of course, but much, much, much harder. If you're interested in cryptography, there's a really good article written by Auth0, actually. I'll link it below. It's very interesting. Anyway, we're using the clever little package bcrypt to help us with hashing and sorting. I've seen password sorting and hashing being done in different types of files. If you have a schema, I think it makes sense for it to be in a schema. So that's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to import it in the schema like this. And then we can use the mongoose pre method before saving the password. So we can include what we want to do to the password before it saves the password via a callback function. The next parameter tells Mongoose you're done and ready to move to the next step in the execution chain. The this is a value here. that depends on the context in which it appears. So it may depend on the function, the class or global. In a function, the value of this depends on how a function is called at runtime known as runtime binding. And they may be different each time that the function is called. MDN goes into a lot of detail on this, so I'll link that below. In our callback function, we're saying that the user is this particular user object that the function is accessing on. And if the password has been modified, so if the user has opted to update their password, or if it's a brand new user, i.e. a new user has signed up, we can hash and sort the password. We start by setting up the number of sort rounds, which is typically 10. Sort rounds is how much time it takes to calculate a single bcrypt hash. The more time, the more difficult it will be for hackers. A sort round of 10 means the calculation is done 2 to the power of 10 times, which is about a thousand times. This is okay for a single login, but poses a much bigger problem for hackers who are trying millions of possible password combinations to figure out the right one. If there is a sort error, we essentially stop the process. Otherwise, we generate the hash with bcrypt's hash method, which takes the user's password, the sort generated earlier as parameters, and ultimately returns the hash, which we set as the user's password instead. If the user has not opted to update their password, or if the user is not a new user signing up, we don't hash or sort anything, so we simply return next. When we try it now,
you can see that the hashed and sorted password looks like this. This is much more secure for the user because even we as administrators of this web app can't see what the actual password for the user is. Now that we don't know what the user's password is, how do we check that it's the correct password when the user logs in again? Here's how. We first add the compare password method to the user model. Then we use bcrypt's built-in compare method, which takes the password being entered when the user logs in and the hashed password to see if it's a match. We then need to use this information in our backend login route. So in our API folder, within the user folder in login.js line 13, instead of this comparator here, we do user.compare password feeding in the password. If there is a match error, we return a failure message. If there is not a match, we return the same message. If it is a match, we send the user info to the front end to make it more personalized for the user. And that's it, hashing and sorting. Now your sign up and login system is well seasoned. I also wanted to use this opportunity to try out email.js as an alternative to NodeMailer. It's pretty simple to set up. You do need to sign up for an account with them though. It'll be for the forgotten password process. You can use the NodeMailer process that we did for the React project, making the relevant updates for Next.js, or you can follow along with this. I'm learning email.js as I'm doing this, so there's probably not going to be that much talking for this part. You're also welcome to skip forward to deployment if you're not bothered. This is the last step before deployment. And at this point, you might just want to see how deployment works. So feel free to jump ahead as well.
um, deploying with Vercel is so easy. I think I must have said this a million times now. Here we go. You can see I've deployed a project called Course Pilot. It's available at coursepilot.co, which compares coding boot camps. Feel free to check it out if of interest. I'll add the link below. But to add a new project, we just click on this button here, select project. We want to import this Next.js version of the project. So you select whatever name you have given your project. And you can see that this is connected to my GitHub account and it shows all of the repos that I have in my GitHub. If you're planning on deploying several projects, I think it's easy to just have Vercel access all of the repos in your GitHub. If the project that you're working on is the only one that you want to deploy via Vercel, obviously when you first connect your GitHub account to it, you just select only this project. You can also change this in your settings later on as well. So next step in Vercel, you can change the project name here if you want to. Add all of your environment variables from your .n file here. And then everything else should just be the default settings, unless you're working on very specific projects. So generally speaking, you just click on deploy. And that is it. Can you believe it? If you get build error from the cell relating to the wrong quotation marks being used, you can use the suggested quotation marks that it gives you, or you can add rules to the lint JSON file to ignore this. This is basically a typography issue and hinders on the idea of using the right quotation mark, which originates from typewriter days. It's deciding whether you use curly quotation marks or not. A part of me thinks it's quite old fashioned, so I'm quite lax with it and I add the rules to ignore this warning. But I know some developers are very insistent on using the correct punctuation. And if it's your own personal project, you can choose either getting into the habit of using the correct quotation marks or choose to ignore it. I'll find some good articles on this and you can make a more informed decision. So yep, yeah, deployment is usually very quick depending on the size of your project. So any of these smaller projects can be done in less than a minute. I have already linked it to the domain, so it's live and ready to be used. And in fact, by this point, certainly it has been used. So yeah, check it out. There have been some updates to it, but the core features are the same. Now you know how React translates into Next.js. And the next time you start a new project, you can start Next.js from scratch. I connected a domain, but when you deploy, the project is hosted on Vercel's domain, so it would still be live. And it will be great for your portfolio because people can then see it and use it. So yeah, highly recommend Next.js, especially if you're thinking of deploying. I could talk about Next.js for days, so I'll stop now. See you next time.